All of them. Uh, and then put in, plug in the earbuds and just uh, listen to make sure that we're actually getting sound. Yeah. That should be able to get it. And then click on the like logo. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Jed Greenberg. I'm a programming director of the University of Chicago Federal Society. And along with the University of Chicago Law and Economic Society, it's my distinct honor to welcome Judge Frank Easterbrook to our chapter. Um, we've all read him in our case books, but for a lot of us, this is our first time seeing him speak. And I, am, for one, am very excited. So a little bit of background on Judge Easterbrook. He graduated from Swarthmore College with high honors and was a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He subsequently attended the University of Chicago Law School, where he served as an editor on the University of Chicago Law Review, and graduated cum laude as a member of the Order of the Court. After law school, Judge Easterbrook clerked on the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit for Judge Levin H. Campbell, and subsequently joined the United States Solicitor General's Office, where he was an assistant and then a deputy Solicitor General of the United States, becoming one of the country's top appellate advocates and receiving a commendation for outstanding service. Judge Easterbrook joined the faculty of the law school in 1978 and subsequently taught as the Lee and Brenna Freeman Professor of Law in 1980. Uh, four, he was nominated to the bench by President Ronald Reagan and was subsequently took off, took the bench in 1985. Um, Judge Easterbrook has numerous scholarly interests, including corporate law, antitrust, criminal procedure, and has published extensively on both topics. Judge Easterbrook, among many other esteemed organizations, is, an, is a member of the American Law Institute and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Judge Easterbrook. Thank you for that kind introduction. I assume the Law and Economic Society is responsible for purchasing your attendance by providing lunch. <laughs> I don't think when I was a student that lunch ever came with lunch and talks. You had to settle for food for the mind. <laughs> I, I want to think back to uh, the events of 38 years ago, shortly after the Federalist Society was founded here and at Yale. In 1985, the same year that I joined the bench, Attorney General Edwin Meese spoke at the ABA's annual convention. Although a few pesky academics had engaged in esoteric debates about constitutional theory, judges generally approached their work in an atheoretic way. They considered precedent, the lawyer's arguments, some law office history, and beliefs about good governance without discussing what role each played or why, or without much effort to reduce these factors to a common metric. With everything in play, and nothing dispositive, it was difficult to criticize the outcome and impossible to refute it, no matter what the outcome was. Political figures who asked what judges were doing were even less thoughtful. One common strand of criticism called for judges to engage in strict construction or to employ plain meaning. Well, plain meaning is a delusion. Cases come to court would just because meaning is not plain. Meaning is often plain, but when it is, you don't pay lawyers to litigate. And strict construction of what? I always wondered. Why should construction be strict rather than something else? Some clauses of the Constitution are precise. It takes a two-thirds vote in each house to override a presidential veto. And that rule can be applied strictly. But others are standards rather than rules. Think of the Fourth Amendment. Unreasonable searches and seizures are prohibited. What's unreasonable? You can't answer that by being strict. Often the calls for strict construction were thinly disguised pleas for the judiciary to endorse whatever the states, 
or the national government or any other political actor had done. Yet the Constitution is designed to limit the powers of government as much as it is designed to empower government. And judges faithful to the Constitution must render many decisions that political officials dislike. There was another serious problem with the strict versus loose business. Everyone ignored the level of generality at which to read a constitutional text. One common move was to extract from a text a principle that could be said to stand for something, and then use that principle when a new dispute arose. The example I'm going to give you today is Maryland against Craig, which many of you may have met. Maryland allows children to testify in criminal trials by closed circuit television. That way the child doesn't need to look the accused abuser in the eye. <coughs> Five justices concluded that this satisfies the confrontation clause of the Sixth Amendment. They asked, well, why do we have confrontation? To which they answered roughly, so that defendants may receive fair trials. Having boosted the level of abstraction, the majority then asked, did this defendant get a fair trial? To which they answered, yes. That was that. The author of that opinion, Justice O'Connor, had been appointed by President Reagan. But confrontation vanished in the shuffle, a point made in dissent by Justice Scalia. The real Constitution doesn't say all trials must be fair. It contains a series of rules, which the drafters may have anticipated would produce fair trials, but what's in the Constitution are the rules. Justice Scalia emphasized the rule, confrontation, while the majority emphasized the hoped for effects. Both could claim to be strict, but at least one of them got the answer wrong. Attorney General Meese then called on judges to use a jurisprudence of original intent. That had the great virtue of being neutral between the government and private litigants, and recognizing that sometimes the Constitution is a real constraint on governmental conduct, as Justice Scalia had argued in Craig. Mises' proposal also had the great virtue of creating an approach under which a judicial decision could be wrong. Did the framers intend to allow testimony from behind a screen or over TV, or didn't they? But the proposed approach had at least four problems. First, Attorney General Meese didn't tell us why the framers' intent should matter. They didn't enact their states of mind, they adopted texts. Indeed, they deliberated in secret precisely because they didn't want their original intent to matter. Jefferson Powell showed in a wonderful article that the founding generation did not <coughs> hold an intentionalist theory of interpretation. Of course, their intent about their own intent also shouldn't matter. <laughs> The problem with original intent is not simply that texts rather than states of mind got adopted, but also that collective bodies don't have intents. Each individual framer may have had an intent, but other framers had different goals, objectives, and reasons. The text is a result of compromise. All they intended collectively was to adopt the text they adopted. That's the principal reason why today's originalists refer to original public meaning, an objective benchmark, rather than original intent. Second, using intent as a benchmark did nothing to settle the level of generality problem. The majority in Craig proclaimed faithfulness to the original intent, but they referred to intent about the consequences of a rule rather than intent about the content of a rule. Any approach that can be used to turn a rule into a standard and then pour new content into the standard is unsatisfactory. Third, 
Attorney General Meese suggested that we should use original intent because the framers themselves wanted this. That claim is problematic on historical grounds and deficient on its own terms. A jurisprudence of original intent must refer to what the framers intended by what they put in the Constitution. And apart from the Ninth Amendment, which says that the enumeration of some rights, quote, shall not be construed to deny others, quote, quote, the Constitution doesn't contain any rule of interpretation. It doesn't tell us how later generations should read its text. If only the text binds and the Constitution has no meta rule of interpretation, the living can decide for themselves how to interpret the founding document. This was an opening that Justices Brennan and Stevens exploited in responding to Attorney General Meese. Finally, a reference to original intent fails because in most interesting cases, there's none to find. What did the framers think about testifying over television? <laughs> Why they thought nothing at all about it for perfectly obvious reasons. And one cannot ask after the fashion of imaginative reconstruction what they would have thought had the question been put to them. Any judge can impute any answer to them because they can't talk back. More importantly, the question is illegitimate because it treats the framers as homunculi sitting in the minds of judges and answering today's questions. But their authority expired long ago. They can't answer today's questions. They are dead. I don't mean by this to be particularly critical of Attorney General Meese. The difference between original intent and original public meaning was not clearly articulated until well after 1985. And in later years, uh, attorney, former Attorney General Meese embraced original public meaning. But does replacing intent with public meaning solve our problems? I think not for three principal reasons. First, there's often no original public meaning to be found. Second, when the authors did address a subject, their resolution was often indeterminate. And third, there is a fear of the dead hand. Justices Brennan and Stevens, in responding to Attorney General Meese, made particular use of the second and third. Let me elaborate briefly. First, there was often no decision at all on a problem that matters today. Think of the Second Amendment. In Heller against the District of Columbia, the justices debated whether that amendment creates private rights. Originalists see Heller as a triumph of originalist method, because both Justice Scalia for the majority and Justice Stevens for the dissent embraced original meaning as the measure of legitimate interpretation today. But look at what happened in Heller. After deciding that the Second Amendment creates private rights, the majority needed to decide whether those private rights include the right of the people to keep unlocked handguns at home. But that subject was not debated or resolved in the 18th century because the question had never been proposed. The justices had to extrapolate. In order to give any answer, they turned a rule into a standard that you see what's coming. Right? They turned a rule into a standard and then poured some meaning into the standard. And this time, it was Justice Scalia who did that, even though he had objected when Justice O'Connor did it in Craig. The problem that I want to emphasize is that the answers, as an original matter, can't be found because they aren't there. They aren't there because the authors of the governing text never ask the question of themselves. This is a fundamental point in linguistics, made by Wittgenstein and elaborated by others. A text doesn't contain any rule beyond those points actively addressed and resolved. But modern debates often deal with issues that were unimaginable 
two centuries ago. Second, often we know that a decision has been made but can't recover it. Does the Commerce Clause allow Congress to regulate marijuana that was grown locally, that is, that has never crossed state lines? Here there may have been a real decision about the phrase commerce among the several states. But the meaning of language depends on context, not simply the context of that phrase, among other phrases in the Constitution, but the context of the times. This is Wittgenstein again. Words have meaning only to an interpretive community. And if that community dies, the meaning of the words is lost. That's why we needed the Rosetta Stone to decipher hieroglyphics. And it's why we still can't decipher Linear A, the Minoan script. William Winslow Krosky, who taught con law at this law school, tried to reconstruct the original interpretive community of the Commerce Clause. He concluded, based on his reading of late 18th century newspapers and pamphlets, that commerce among the states really means all commerce that occurs in any state. That means that transborder shipments are unnecessary to national power. Charles Fairman, who taught constitutional law and legal history at Harvard, read the same sources and reached a more conventional conclusion. Who's right? Judges can't be historians. It's not simply that we lack the training. It's that we don't have the time. So judges can't be historians, and more importantly, judges of this century can't read 18th century press clippings the way the interpretive community of the 18th century read them. Trying to reconstruct an interpretive community is as hard and maybe harder than trying to figure out how an old interpretive community would have understood words. The solution sometimes proposed is, well, just wait for historians to agree on the outcome. Good luck. <laughs> You're not going to be able to resolve any interesting constitutional case. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Here's another example, again from the Second Amendment. McDonald against Chicago held that the Second Amendment applies to the states. The right question for original public meeting is whether the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment incorporates the Bill of Rights. Krosky thought that the answer is yes on historical grounds. Fairman thought that the answer is no. The Slaughterhouse cases held no. Many modern legal historians think that Slaughterhouse is wrong. Many, but not all. One of the dissenters is Philip Hamburger, who used to teach legal history here. When MacDonald reached the Supreme Court, only Justice Thomas was willing to decide it on the basis of original meaning. He wanted to overrule Slaughterhouse. The plurality preferred an approach devised by Chief Justice Warren and Justice Brennan in the 1950s and 1960s, <coughs> calling it settled law even though it is historical fiction. The dissent preferred Justice Cardozo's a historical approach from the 1930s. <clears throat> what a come down from Heller in which all nine justices took an originalist position. By McDonald, there was only one originalist left, uh, and he was taking a position on an unsettled historical question. So let me come to number three. Everyone purports to fear the dead hand. Let me give you another gun example. When people are convicted of domestic violence, but their crimes are classified as misdemeanors rather than felonies, may they possess handguns? Does the Second Amendment give them a right to possess handguns? Now, that's a subject of considerable importance to battered spouses and children, and society at large. Justice Brennan asked, all of us should ask, 
What sense it makes to think that the politicians who adopted the 14th Amendment in the 1860s answered that question for us, when all interesting circumstances are different today from what they were 150 years ago, and no one, absolutely no one in the debates about the privileges or immunities clause addressed that question. Right? It's revolting to answer modern questions from a perspective in which the issue, even if formally posed, meant something completely different to the drafters than it does today. Justice Holmes made that point long ago, and it's never been answered. So what follows from this? The view of many judges and professors is that originalism has suffered a death blow and that the living must muddle through as best they can. These responses to originalism start with the proposition that the judiciary will answer tough modern questions, like the one I just posed about domestic violence conditions. With that premise fixed, and originalism knocked out, the authors then debate what is the best way for the judiciary to give its answer. I think that framework itself is the problem. We can't simply assume judicial review and then plug in any decision-making approach that we like. Judicial review is still another thing that isn't in the Constitution. It has to be justified. And it's justified by an interpretive amendment. Every judge who proposes to set aside legislative or executive action must justify judicial review rather than just assume that power. Now I'm taking you back even closer to the beginning. The major premise of Marbury against Madison, which all of you must have met by now, is that the Constitution is law, the supreme law, binding all organs of government, and sufficiently clear to be enforceable as law. Chief Justice Marshall gives the ex post facto clause as an example, and he asks rhetorically whether in the case of a clear conflict between a criminal statute and the ex post facto clause, the defendant is supposed to go to jail. Another premise in Marbury is that the Constitution includes a hierarchy, that it is supreme over treaties, and treaties prevail over statutes. Finally, Marshall asserts that every public official owes a duty by virtue of his oath, if not the written nature of the document, to follow the supreme law in the case of conflict. Written instruments are supposed to have bite, and our Constitution not only is written, but also establishes a system of limited government. If there are limits, then there are boundaries that have to be patrolled. Otherwise, our government is not limited after all. Now, there are problems in this way of justifying judicial review. For example, it begs the important question why political actors have to pay more attention to the judiciary than the judiciary pays to them. The Chief Justice Marshall's implicit answer is that the constitutional hierarchy binds all the branches, and that to demonstrate the argument for the meaning of the Constitution is to produce acquiescence. Congress and the President must agree with the court because the same syllogism that drives the court drives everybody else too. That is, there are understandable rules, they were laid down in the past, and they govern us still. And to have identified a rule laid down in the past is to have identified the reason why everybody has to obey now. The Supreme Court's decision about the content of the rules prevails because of the definition of a rule given to all alike. So judicial review under Marbury is a search for rules. If the age or generality of the text frustrates the statement of a rule, it also defeats the claim for judicial power, as Marbury understood that claim. If the living must indeed chart their own course, then the question is political, outside the scope of judicial review. You can't have a view that denies the power of the past to rule today's affairs, yet asserts that Article III alone still binds.
Mitchell reviewed depends on a belief that there are decisions taken long ago that remain authoritative, that the justice's duty, as Hamilton said in Federalist Number 78, is to declare all acts contrary to the manifest tenor of the Constitution void. That assumes that the document has a manifest tenor. The writers and ratifiers thought that it did. When it doesn't, the argument for judicial review fails. <coughs> Marbury teases judicial review from structure rather than length. It therefore necessarily admits the possibility of other inferential structural claims, a possibility that quickly developed in the intergovernmental immunity argument, the tax immunity doctrine of McCulloch against Maryland. Structural arguments can enlarge review further. Perhaps judicial review flows from the terror of the alternative. So it seemed to Holmes, who said, that the Republic would collapse if there were no power to review the constitutionality of state legislation, though there was really no need to review the constitutionality of federal legislation. And so it seemed to, to Learned Hand, whose argument goes, and I'm quoting from Hand, it was probable, if indeed it was not certain, that without some arbiter whose decision was final, the whole system would have collapsed the courts were undoubtedly the best department in which to vest such a power, since by the independence of their tenure, they were least likely to be influenced by diverting pressure. It was not a lawless act to import into the Constitution such a grant of power. But Hand admitted that that line of argument has a corollary, and I'm quoting from him again, it was absolutely essential to confine the power to the need that evoked it. That is, it was and always has been necessary to distinguish between the frontiers of another department's authority and the propriety of its choices within those frontiers. The doctrine of judicial review presupposed that it was possible to make such a distinction, although at times it is difficult to do so. One important implication of this understanding is that when the framers did not create a rule, when the issue is novel, when the original interpretive community cannot be recovered reliably, we have neither judicial review nor the feared debt hand, but democracy. And democracy is the core of the Constitution. Today's issues are decided by today's elected representatives. That's a democratic process, and either the political variety or the hermeneutic variety of evolution defeats the premises of judicial review. If the living are to decide, then why only those living people who wear judicial robes? It is only when, for reasons of political legitimacy, that the living are not to decide that judicial review is justified. Then faithfulness to the premises of judicial review implies originalism. You can't have a hierarchy of law with the Constitution prevailing by pride of place unless there is genuine meaning in that document. When the best solution reflects evolving institutions and ideas or common law principles, then the living must decide by election. For one branch, the judiciary to claim the final word about debatable propositions is not only unoriginalist, but contra-constitutionalist. Nothing beats textualism in court because nothing else is capable of supporting a judicial veto. But let me try one last way to put this. Many constitutional theories compete in the intellectual marketplace. They are not valid or invalid. The Constitution itself is not based on a unitary theory. The framers didn't share a single vision, but reached a complex compromise that enabled the nation to exist. And even if they had had a single unitary theory, we must always ask why we should respect that theory today. After all, the framers were revolutionaries, and we have the right to be revolutionaries too if the document they wrote no longer supplies satisfactory answers to our controversies. But there is no respectable claim that the revolution 
carried on by people in robes whose judgments cannot be disagreed with. Each non-textual theory comes with its own set of implications for proper scope and use. If you think about people you have read uh, in this law school, theories of fidelity, theories of the common law, theories of pragmatism. Those are all reasons why the living should decide, but they can't explain why the decision must be made by people who can't be voted out of office. I do not know and cannot imagine any non-originalist theory in which only Article III and the power of judicial review are sacrosanct, and that even decisions as old as McCulloch are turned on their head because you will remember that what McCulloch held is that when there is any uncertainty in the Constitution, the well, legislative power prevails, right? How is it that Marbury can be right and McCulloch wrong when we're thinking of novel theories? Judicial review came from a theory of meaning that supposed the possibility of right answers encoded in text. Deny the possibility of right answers encoded in text, and you knock out judicial review. The non-originalist theories don't even pretend that there are right answers encoded by an older supermajority. So they defeat judicial review and leave democracy. And at this point, I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. So if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll call on you. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I agree with much of it. But my question is, so you begin to talk with saying, you know, part of, you know, the Constitution powers government, but at the same time, it. and if you read the Federalist Papers, they also make this point that, you know, judicial review isn't a problem because it's the court saying that the legislative branch stepped out of its bounds. It's not the court putting itself in the legislative branch. But from what I understand, you said, okay, when the Constitution has a rule, ex post facto clause, judicial review is fine, judicial review is okay. But when there's only standards like I don't know, equal protection or unreasonable, then, you know, if they want, the court should be more deferential and be in the legislative branch. But doesn't that, isn't that intention of my my approach doesn't have anything to do with deference. You didn't hear me say that word, right? What I wanted to know is, is there a rule encoded in the text? If yes, it can be decided by a judge. If no, the decision should be made by political actors. No one's deferring to anything in that system. I think it's a mistake to talk about deference. Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, I did mean to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean to stop your train of thought. Oh, uh, evidently it's not a very good one. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, my question is, if the Constitution is supposed to impose constraints, it seems like you're saying that it's only when there's a rule in the Constitution the judiciary has any role in constraining the legislative branch. And is, is that intention, you think, at all, with the idea of the Constitution limiting uh, government? Or do you think when, when the founders put a standard in, they're okay with the legislative branch coming to an answer. And, and I don't care whether they were okay with anything, right? I don't care about the contents of their heads. I care about the encoded rules, right? And the main things that are encoded in the Constitution are the rules for organizing the national government, how laws are made, what the relation is between Congress and the president, and so on. All those are very important. Right? So I don't have any trouble with decisions of the Supreme Court saying that what got to be called the one-house veto uh, was absurd. Right? The President has a veto. Houses of Congress don't have veto. Right? That's actually there. It's written in the text. We know it's got a veto, and it's not the House of Representatives. Right? So you can, you can apply a lot of things that are binding on the national government, but when that understanding runs out, and I gave some examples today, right? Is, does the Second Amendment prohibit barring a domestic uh, 
violence misdemeanor from having a weapon. Nothing's encoded there. Right? I thought they went as far as they could in Heller by saying, okay, we have decided on originalist grounds that the Second Amendment creates private rights. Fine. But what are those private rights? We don't really know. For what it's worth, now I'm inclined to think that for anything involving the state governments, the Constitution itself tells us that the principal decision has to be made by the legislature. I mean, think about the 14th Amendment, for example. Uh, the, what was thought at the time, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say what was thought at the time, what was decided at the time. <laughs> the most important part of the 14th Amendment was Section 5, which tends to get overlooked. Section 5 says Congress has the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The Supreme Court in recent decades has said something like, oh yeah, that gives Congress the power to enforce our decisions. No, no, no. What rubbish. That gives Congress the power to enforce the 14th Amendment. And there may be disagreements between Congress and the Supreme Court about what that is. And when that happens, according to Section 5, Congress is supposed to win. And that's what it says. Yeah, no, no. Oh, uh, yeah, I had a question. Uh, so kind of under this um, this view of the Constitution, like what percentage of the Constitution's text do you think has like a clear encoded rule that can be divined? And like what percentage of the Constitution's text becomes like, kind of superfluous? Like it, it doesn't generate a clearly encoded rule. So oh, almost all of it has and still has had and still has clearly encoded rules. The problem is that those rules were enforced, announced, and enforced a long time ago, uh, and the world moves on with people wanting to add rules to them that didn't used to be there. Right? Take, take the question whether you can replace confrontation with testifying over a closed circuit TV. Confrontation was a well understood term. It means you have to show up and face the person in the dock, right? People then decide, well, oh, you know, that, that's kind of hard on young or impressionable accusers. So instead of doing that, we'll do something else that's better. And it may be better, but it's different, right? So I'm completely with Justice Scalia in that case. The Constitution had an answer. The question was whether it would be applied or not, or whether we would make something up in its stead. And as soon as you're inclined to make something up, you've destroyed the basis of judicial review. Uh, yeah, I wonder if you could parse out more where you draw the line between what you are arguably the Constitution and some of the United statements that are defined with reference to a group of people in the world and how they do it. So if you could go into a bit more detail about how you parse the line between finding one of these rules that's included versus making something up, it, it, it seems like if you can refer back to every word in the room recently, can refer back to tradition and government understanding, there are ways of finding a rule that might not be sort of facially apparent from the text. So where is that line between make fabrication and recovery of the rule? It's a very difficult question, and I'm inclined to think that it probably differs rule by rule. You need to understand the rule uh, and how it was originally implied in uncon originally applied in uncontested cases. Right. Imagine that there's a dispute now going on among the justices about the propriety of New York Times against Saul, right? which, as you all know, say the Constitution bans the use of libel law uh, against newspapers unless there was some knowingly or recklessly false statement that the old common law standard no longer suffices. Well, one can go back to the time of the Constitution and the First Amendment and ask what libel law was like, and can ask as a historical matter whether the First Amendment was pleaded as a defense in a libel case. The answer is no, it wasn't. No one thought there was any conflict between the First Amendment and libel. 
it's, it's not, again, I, I, it's so easy to slip into the language of thought or intention. No one behaved then, that is the living interpretive community, no one behaved then as if there were any conflict between libel law and the First Amendment. What, how did they behave? What they saw was that there was a problem when the kind of libel was what was known as seditious libel, that is, libel of government officials. So there was a huge debate at the time about the propriety of the Alien and Sedition Act, right? And different political actors had different responses to that. That, you know, how far the First Amendment prohibits restrictions on seditious libel would be a difficult question. But as a historical matter, it's an easy question. You don't get to the 1960s and then suddenly make up things that no one in the past history of the United States had thought were there. Uh, Dre Stars. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Uh, So you argue quite convincingly against, uh, I think, what you I'm, I'm sorry, could you raise your voice again? Yeah, of course. Thank so you. you argue convincingly against, I think, theoretically inconsistent with interpretive approach. And my question is, do you see any argument for justification circumstance in which a judge might knowingly apply that approach that you're criticizing if, for example, the uh, democratic system is so broken that they must do something practically to fix it, and for some reason they believe that people will listen to judges? Totally illegitimate. <laughs> right? If you think the democratic system is broken, what you should do, what the Declaration of Independence declared, is that you should wage a rebellion against the government. <laughs> but if what you mean by broken, and this is what I what most people, modern people mean by broken is it doesn't produce the results that I like. That's not a broken political system. That's the political system that was designed in the Constitution. The Constitution is designed to make legislation really hard, right? There are these three different branches with three different terms and different ways of making decisions. It was supposed to protect against imprudent choices unless they stood the test of time and had very broad political bases. Uh, and observing that that's true, and that it means that I don't get whatever my favorite rule is, is, is a virtue of the system. It's not, at least as I'm, far as I'm concerned, a reason to rise up in rebellion. Thank you. Very good. <coughs> um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to interpreting uh, what you're saying, but um, what you described reminds me of what, uh, what I've heard of original legal meaning being a better approach. Uh, but and, and I think Professor Bode has argued that um, that sort of the way that judges have always done things. Um, and so I wonder if you think that some of these more contemporary originalist uh, theories are more divergences from how uh, judges have done things in the past. And I wonder <coughs> what you think about, um, I guess, judicial interpretive theory education, uh, whether what some judges are doing today is really masquerading as that, but not actually that, and, and, and how the implications of it. Someplace along the line I got lost. <laughs> um, you know, I, I understand the argument, I mean, you, you refer to original legal meaning, implying that you wouldn't have liked Professor Krosky's effort to look at what newspapers were saying about the meaning of comments. I have no idea whether the, the original legal meaning of commerce among the several states differed from the popular approach, uh, in, in part because I have no real way of reconstructing that interpretive community. I've, I've always thought, I mean, put the Constitution to one side. Congress passes these statutes. Um, and the statutes have the same aging problem as the Constitution does. One of the examples I sometimes give is a wonderful little statute called the Capper Volstead Act. It's an amendment to the Sherman Act in 1920, which takes 
the business of agriculture outside the scope of the Sherman Act. The question arose in 1976, where I was on one side representing the United States, and Judge Posner was on the other side representing the chicken industry, <laughs> uh, about what the business of, of agriculture was. Right. If you went back to 1920 and looked at how people were talking about agriculture, they were talking about individually owned farms. They weren't talking about Purdue chicken and agribusiness. Now, it may be that the meaning of statutes can change. I'm inclined to think that the Sherman Act was, in fact, a delegation of power to the judiciary. The Capitol Holstead Act may not have been. It's not clear that you could, in principle, try to draw a distinction between how lawyers would have understood the business of agriculture in 1920 and how the people engaged in agriculture would have understood it in 1920. So we filled our briefs in the Supreme Court, Judge Posner and I filled our briefs in the Supreme Court with stuff from back then, but Judge Posner's main plea to the justices was that they just pay no attention to what these stupid farmers had believed back in the 1920s because we know that agribusiness is much more efficient than that old way of doing things. Uh, and of course, the, the answer was given, just in case you never read this opinion, it's National Broiler Marketing Association against the United States. The Supreme Court's great originalist, Justice Blackman, <laughs> said that it was necessary to understand this word the way farmers would have understood it in the 1920s, and not the way professors of law understood it in the 1970s. I think that was probably right for trying to distinguish between lawyers in the 20s and farmers in the 20s would have been a fool's term. Um, yeah, that. You mentioned that judges don't have time to be historians, but isn't that a good part of what lawyers and judges do anyway when you're looking at past cases, past history, looking at old dictionaries, that history, looking at a legislative debate, that history, isn't when people say we don't have time to be a historian, it's only an argument going to be half a historian and only look at certain material, but not others? It's okay, I don't have time to do those other things either. <laughs> <laughs> I never look at legislative history. <laughs> because it's not an active text, right? I, I never want to look at that. Uh, I think you mentioned a few other things that I, I also save time by, by not looking at <laughs> if, if you consider what I do, you know, the, the number of appeals filed in the U.S. Court of Appeals has been slowly going down a percentage or two a year for the last 20, 22, 23 years. So I'm not as busy as I used to be. But it's still the case that over the course of a year, I have to resolve, I have to vote on something like 350 cases uh, in a panel of three. I'm responsible for the disposition in a third of those. The average case has two or three issues. Some cases have only one, but some lawyers you know, brief a lot. If you try to figure out how many hours per issue have. It's not very many, right? Figure 2,000 business hours in a year. It's not very many per issue to read the briefs, understand the history, brush up on the precedents, write an opinion, concur or dissent from my colleagues' opinions, and so on. Now, I, I don't want to make this, make this claim too hard because a lot of these issues I'm pretty familiar with. And so the amount of time I spent on them is three minutes. Uh, but a lot of the issues are novel. One reason <coughs> cases get to a court of appeals is because the issue is sufficiently hard that it rewards paying lawyers to go and brief and address the issue. The cases that are simple tend to be criminal cases where we are subsidizing the defense lawyers and where they make the same arguments over and over and over. So I am really a specialist in cocaine prosecutions. <laughs> and in my spare time, I might do securities law or antitrust law or something like that. And if I didn't have my 
academic background in antitrust and securities and so on to, to draw on, I would really be at sea in some of those fields. Wouldn't have the time. The idea that I would have the time to go and do real serious history about even the Capper Volstead Act of 1920 is, is quite mistaken. I wrote, my name is on the brief for the United States in that case, but all the history was found by a very large staff in the appellate section of the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. I didn't find it myself. And I will bet you a very large sum that George Posner had other people doing that search too. Yeah. Um, so just following up on an earlier question about the difficulty maybe of determining when there actually is a rule successfully encoded somewhere or exactly what it is. I was wondering if you could clarify what you said about Keller, because I think you said that you were all right with the decision that uh, there were some private rights established, but that we couldn't know what they were. Um, maybe I just misunderstood what you said there, but I'm just curious, like, what, what do you think the boundary of the rule is or how to deal with it if it's unknowable in some way? I'm, the decision to the extent I know anything about legal history, which I've just been stressing, is very, very limited. The decision that the Second Amendment creates private as well as public rights seems correct. And if you were to look around at what that meant, it would have meant that people had the right to possess the kind of weapons that you would use if you were called up into the militia. Long guns, for example. You now have the modern question is something like unlocked pistols or the kind of case that's being litigated now, semi-automatic weapons like the AR-15 with high capacity magazines. Historically, there's no answer to that. There were no historical analogs to that. Uh, so if you're looking for what do we know from the history about the propriety whether there's a constitutional entitlement to possess those weapons, I think we don't know anything. And that leads me to think that we should be correspondingly modest in claims of judicial review. But that doesn't, that is not how all people have interpreted Heller. Hmm. Uh, we have time for one, one more question. So. Uh, so I take you to mean that um, judges don't really have the legitimate authority to sort of uh, overrule Congress if there's not an encoded rule in the Constitution. And I was just kind of curious what you think about the idea that there is some democratic legitimacy among judges and the fact that if the president selects them in the Senate consents to their selection and confirmation. And isn't that a way that the democratic process is sort of choosing how we resolve these legal issues in the Constitution? Well, there's legitimacy in the same sense that there's legitimacy in the House of Lords in England that at some point, somebody made each of these critters a lord. <laughs> but they are, right, they are nobility for life. And the central decision made, you know, the central assertion in the Declaration of Independence, and the central decision in the Constitution was that we were not to be ruled over by the nobility, by a king we couldn't get rid of, by the lords we couldn't get rid of. And if today the federal judiciary looks more like the House of Lords, that seems to me a problem rather than a solution. Uh, I think we can squeeze one more. So, <laughs> Matt, uh, thank you for talking today. Uh, the way you've presented the debate sometimes is as if our only option is to look back and see if there's a clear rule or not. But there also seems to be a lot of rules of interpretation that mediate the way that we discover rules from the past certain linguistic canons, substantive canons, uh, rules like stare decisis. Can those sorts of rules mediate the problems of discovering rules from the past, such that even though in the abstract question we can't know definitively what the right interpretation of the Constitution is, these sorts of rules can like justify judicial review, not just standing there? In what way justify? I mean, you take, take any one of the examples I threw out today, I mean, how are canons of construction going to help us? Now, this, this is, after all, the University of Chicago. It was here that Carl Llewellyn wrote his famous list, the canons of construction. 
with, yes, well, remedial statutes should be liberally construed on the left hand and on the right hand, but statutes in derogation of the common law should be strictly construed. And it turns out all remedial statutes are in derogation of the common law, and now you have a total mess on your hands. I don't know how that's going to help us with constitutional interpretation. I can imagine it helping with statutory interpretation. I mean, one of the statutory questions that comes before the court often enough is whether there is a private right of action to enforce the statute without some express in the statute. I can imagine a, a protocol that says something like, over time, the Supreme Court has favored adding these to statutes and disfavored adding these to statutes. Look at when the statute was enacted. If the statute was enacted around the time that J.I. case against Borak was decided by the Supreme Court, and Borak said, well, where there's a right, there's a remedy. We don't worry about its absence in the statute. You look at a statute enacted around that time, it makes sense to say that that's what that statute means. The modern interpretation is, if it's not there, it's not there. Right? So you look at a statute enacted since that became the norm in the late 1970s, uh, and it's, well, it's not there. Right? It helps give you presets. But I have a lot of trouble seeing how this helps much with constitutional interpretation. Thank you so much.